Hello, beautiful people. I am Daisy, your hostess. And in this video, we continue on with the book titled The Man Who Knew by Ralph Waldo Trine. We've already covered several chapters, so if you just found us at this video, welcome, welcome. Please do make sure that you go to my video playlist and catch up with the previous chapters. And to our subscribing community here, welcome back. Before I head on to the next chapter, I'll share my highlights from the previous two chapters that were titled, He Called It The Way and To Know That All Is Well. One of the statements that captured my attention was when the author wrote that God rules the world and replenishes the earth through established laws. Again, he adds that God lives and rules in the life of man. He does so through the channel of the mind. And so a couple things we go back to the messages brought by Jesus, especially as it was addressed in this book where Jesus brought the good news, reminding us or bringing us this novel information that we are looking for God in all the wrong places, that the kingdom of heaven is within us. That was his good news. That was the main thing of his ministry, to seek God within yourself. That's where you're going to find him. And now it, this author goes on a little bit deeper by saying that all of this is happening, that God is ruling the world through established laws. Now the thing is, my dear one, we're not going to find these laws written in any book. Sure, we could say, well, you know, if you go to the Bible, if you go to scripture, it is written there. The thing is, is that not everybody goes to the Bible. But the point here is in defining what these established laws are, are these physical laws, are these legal laws, are these scientific laws. As it turns out, there's much written about natural laws versus scientific laws. Mind you, that has nothing to do with the religious law also, so it's important for us to see that distinction here. When we're trying to establish what did the author mean when he stated that God rules the world and replenishes the earth through established laws. So it doesn't take a genius. I think that this is referring to the natural laws. And there's much written about these natural laws. And most of our science, by observing nature, they can see patterns. And with this, can begin to create what they call their scientific laws or their physical laws or whatever they want to uh, create and establish for the progress of the human race. And again, the natural laws can be somewhat identified by our observation of nature itself. So if we go to, let's say, Isaac Newton's discovery of the law of gravity, which I think it was really more of an observation, but that's what we just finished saying. By observing nature, we come to these conclusions that seem to be predictable. And in a nutshell, Newton pretty much was saying that the force acting on a body is equal to the rate of change of the body's momentum. So we can bring a lot into this conversation if we wanted to, but interesting that God rules the world and replenishes the earth through established laws. And I believe that as we become observers of life, we begin to understand these established laws and we can begin to work with it and allow God to work through us. I'm kind of getting what this book is about. What about you? Okay, let me just move on to the next one, um, which was a bullet point here. I wrote, thought is a force. It operates through the natural law. So here we go again. Thought is a force. So find this amusing if you look up uh, the definition of force. In the Oxford Dictionary, pretty much says force is strength or energy as an attribute of physical action or movement. Now Britannica defined it as covert symbolic responses to stimuli that are either intrinsic or extrinsic. So there's a couple of things here as defining it as something that can actually be physical. Now, if any of you have been doing some research on thoughts and, you know, science today, and what they're observing is that thoughts are things. And when you talk about things, what do we think about? Something that is actually physical and tangible. And then adding more to this, where it, it stated that it operates through the natural law. So going into the established laws, is this one of those laws where like attracts like? And so 
as you're putting some energy out there with the speed that you're thinking about it do we draw other thoughts that are similar to this energy well i'm just trying to show here a little bit of today's time and the archaic language or the riddles in which jesus spoke with which seem to have a scientific base allowing people like me simple people to understand profound truths what do you think about that there are two more points is still in conjunction with that the one about thought as a force and how it operates through the natural line and then it went to add that it's it operates through the channel of the mind for me when I think about a channel, I think about something that needs to be tuned into, something that I can switch. So here we go, uh, allowing us to understand that there's something about frequency, something about tuning in, revealing the possibility that it takes work to channel, it takes work to tune into that voice and that connection that we're trying to make with our inner self, even though it's on the inside, it's not on the outside. And finally, uh, I liked when he mentioned uh, about Henry Ford, and he quoted something that Henry Ford said, and he referred to the human being as a central station with myriads of entities going and coming all the time with messages. So let's remember how Henry Ford revolutionized the way we travel. He developed the assembly line technique for mass production, and he was the founder of the Ford Motor Company. By saying what he said, did he have access to messages from other entities that gave him information? All I could tell you is that some of the greatest leaders would, for fear of being ridiculed, would not say such a thing. They would rather keep it to themselves. As for me, I am so super happy that Jesus was okay with going out there and telling everyone, hey, the kingdom of God is within. He didn't care about being ridiculed. So if he didn't, why should I? If only I could have half the insight to have such a deep connection such as he did. So let's move on then uh, to the next chapter before I get into some weird rabbit hole. Uh, who knows if the author might touch upon it. The next chapter here is titled, that superb teaching of sin. The Palestinian Jew of Jesus' day had not only a very limited knowledge of the world and its extent as we know it now, but an exceedingly limited knowledge of the facts and the laws of the universe, the laws of nature, and the laws pertaining to and governing human life as we know them now. The matter of sin and its consequences and penalties occupied an important place in the thoughts and minds of the people. God was not only a punisher of sin, the sins of His, the chosen people, but was also on the lookout to punish the sins of the individual. He demanded appeasement of His wrath, so they thought, and in this thought they acted. Offerings to purchase appeasement and forgiveness and cleansing were made. A system had been manufactured for them and accepted on the part of many, whereby burnt offerings of slain animals or parts of them were burned on the altar of forgiveness as propitiation for their sins. Sin bulked large in the minds of these early people, as it did in that intricately established system which took form from three to four hundred years after Jesus' time, and which pushing far into the background his message and teachings to the extent of almost completely ignoring them, concerned itself with intricate discussions of things, speculative things about him. Both systems now seem non-essential or even puerile, though they have a certain interesting historical value to thinking men and women of today, and to be honest, one should add, to devout men and women of today. They believe that the infinite creative power, or if we prefer the term God, works always through well-established laws, laws that it is given to men to find, to formulate, and to observe. They believe that God does not punish, as we ordinarily understand the term. The violation of the law in itself carries its own punishment, and its observance carries its own reward. The violation of law, either intentionally or unwittingly, be it a law of the universe in which we live, or a law of human living or conduct, brings its corresponding punishment. To observe 
and to live in harmony with the laws of the universe about us and with the laws of human living and conduct brings always beneficent results. The observance of law, then, brings good and always good to him who has intelligence enough to understand and to know it, and sense and will enough to obey it. The violation of law carries always and inevitably its punishment and penalties in the form of suffering and loss. No man has ever been able enough or keen enough, and no man probably ever will be, to escape such penalty and punishment. Better then, to use one's wits and one's will to know and obey the law. The moment the violation ceases, that moment the penalty ceases, and the suffering and the loss which have been its demand begin to decrease and will finally disappear. God then does not punish except through the laws that are already decreed. God is not a bookkeeper, but a life giver, a creator, an establisher of laws. Wise then is he who, when he stumbles or falls, does not waste time in bemoaning his fate, but picks himself up, and all the better instantly gives himself time to see and to understand the cause of the stumble or the fall with its resultant pain or suffering or loss, and goes on about his work with the cheery determination never again. To waste time and energy in regret, which but weakens an otherwise determined spirit, is infinitely worse than to learn and to take to heart in a determined manner, even a joyous manner, a lesson in experience. The word translated sin in our scripture means literally a missing of the mark of the goal, as applied to the runner in a race, the participant in a game. The management doesn't set penalties for him who fails in the race or the game, doesn't kill him, doesn't demand any satisfactions that he or someone else must pay. It is simply that the award is withheld from him. It is given to the one who knows the rules of the game and who plays the game better than he. When the races or the games occur again, he, with the experience he has gained, with better knowledge of the rules and with a more enlightened and determined practice, has still an equal chance to win. If he have stamina and backbone and is willing to pay the price in practice, intelligent practice, and if he have a high-born determination and courage, he probably will win. It depends on whether he is able to change, can, to, will. He may take a leaf from Virgil, who gave to the world enlightening precepts a hundred years or so before Jesus' time, and who said, describing the crew, that to his mind would win the race. They can because they think they can. The master was far more interested in instilling faith and hope and courage in the minds and hearts of his hearers through deeper and better understanding of life than he was in recalling to them their sins, or indeed in saying very much to them about their sins. His insight, his knowledge of life and of human nature, led him to deal always with the positives rather than the negatives of life. His teachings were always creative, constructive, life-giving, not deadening, paralyzing, defeative. He knew the tragedy that creeps into innumerable lives, into minds weak enough and morally flabby enough to go through life continually bowed down with a sense of sin, rather than strong enough quickly to make restitution of it be a sin against the neighbor or to stop the violation of law through a common sense use of mind and will, if it be otherwise. One of the most significant things in his entire ministry is his incomparable parable of the so-called lost or prodigal son. It is perhaps the world's supreme conception and teaching, or shall we say elucidation, of what we term sin and the sinner, and how masterfully it is put. It would seem that no complex system built upon a deliberate departure from the teaching of the master and the formulation of a metaphysical substitution about him could ever take place. Not condemnation, but consideration and love is the very essence of the father's nature. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me and he divided unto them his living. 
and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with righteous living and when he had spent all there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him and when he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and i perish with hunger i will rise and go to my father and will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants and he arose and came to his father but when he was yet a great way off his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and the son said unto him father i have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son but the father said to his servants bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatter calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant and he said unto him thy brother is come and thy father had killed a fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound and he was angry and would not go in therefore came his father out and entreated him and he answering said to his father lo these many years do i serve thee neither transgressed i at any of thy commandment and yet thou never gavest me a kid that i might make merry with my friends but as soon as thy son was come which hath devoured thy living with harlots thou hast killed for him the fatted calf and he said unto him son thou art ever with me and all that i have is thine it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found from the book of luke chapter 16 it is indeed a wonderful parable from the standpoint of the son of the father and the lesson that the master would teach the son found that living the life of the senses uncontrolled by the mind and the spirit did not pay he found that excesses did not pay and in this he was thoroughly disillusioned he found that violation of these laws carried its own penalty and he paid dearly dejection and suffering came and his better self then had a chance to assert itself he realized how much better he had been and how much better off he would be at his father's home his own home the resolve came and back he went the father might have said well my son you've learned your lesson haven't you i'm glad you have in the future he might have thought it but he knew that the son knew it as well as he and he probably felt that confidence an active mental force would be of greater help to the son than anything he could say love is his predominating characteristic he never forgets his child and has looked often for his return the day comes when his love and his faith are rewarded instantly he recognizes that figure though far down the road my boy who was dead is alive again and is coming home instead of waiting in a dignified way his overwhelming love impels him down the road and he runs to welcome him and in the joy of his love the son senses his father's pardon and this is the truth that the master would point in this incomparable parable forgiveness of sin is of the very nature of a living and loving god no sacrifice to be made no burnt offerings no blood of a slain lamb no ordeal in connection with an individual or organization no tribute money it is a spiritual matter between a man and his god to see his folly to repent to turn from his errors and transgressions genuinely to seek forgiveness secures forgiveness 
There is another aspect of truth that the Master brings out when a man seeks divine forgiveness. Forgiveness will be his if he, in turn, has the heart and disposition to forgive. And in this way, he drives home the necessity of an essential human quality. A part of the brief and fundamental prayer that he taught is, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And following very close upon this, he added, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. From the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 14 through 15. End of chapter 7. Stay comfortable right there where you're at. You might even want to refill your coffee, your glass of wine, your tea, whatever it is, your special drink, as I continue now right on in this video to the next chapter, chapter 8, titled, I Am a Man As You Are. Joyfully, the Master trod the highways with a deep-set faith and a burning zeal in the pursuit of his mission, the good news of the kingdom which, if men would hear and recognize, would not only save them from their sins, but would lead them into a knowledge of the fuller, richer life that he would have them attain. Sometimes it was to an individual he spoke, sometimes to a little group, sometimes to a great throng of persons who pressed hard in their eagerness one upon another. Always confident, knowing the source of the truth which he proclaimed, confident always of his power through a complete reliance upon the divine power within that he realized and that he taught, he nevertheless never allowed an inflated ego, that vice of fools, to manifest itself in him. He was always humble. Numbers of times and in various circumstances, he took pains to make this plain. Quote, As he was going forth into the way, there ran one to him and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is, God. End quote. From the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17 through 28. On another occasion, while he was teaching a group that had gathered around him, one old fellow, it is related, got so enthusiastic or so emotional that he fell down and began to worship him. Seeing him, that same sense of personable humility, combined perhaps with amusement or pity, prompted the master to say in substance, No, no, don't do that. Get up, don't do that. I am a man as you are. And how clear-cut, but how telling is his insight and his teaching along the same line. When thou art bidden of any man to a marriage feast, sit not down in the chief seat, Less happily a more honorable man thou be bidden of him, and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and then thou begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest place, that when he that biddeth thee cometh, he may say to thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have glory in the presence of all that sit at meat with thee. For every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, and that he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 8 through 11. Again, the personal simplicity of the Master is shown. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. From the Book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 29. Another interesting lesson in simplicity and humility and their significance in a little different light is pointed by him. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified 
rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. From the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 10 through 14. The verse immediately preceding the Master's words reads, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And still again, along the same general line, how universally applicable and how simple and how clear-cut his statement. Quote, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 through 5 There was something supremely refreshing and simple in the mind of the master as far as the personal self is concerned. When it came, though, to the great truth he had realized and felt he embodied and endeavored so eagerly to reveal to others, we have something of a different tone, something to which he would have all men give attention. He then becomes the voice, the advocate of God with his gospel, his good news, my father's business. Ascending from the personal Jesus to the full realization of the Christ, he speaks with a sense of the power which that realization gives. He changes the expression that he so generally applied to himself, Son of Man, to the form, Son of God. He makes clear, however, the basis of it. Of myself I can do nothing. It is the Father that worketh in me. My Father works and I work. The Christ Consciousness I and my Father are one now assumes complete mastery and dedicating his life to the proposition as he states it as i am you shall be and enlisting at once the attention of men he sets forth his claims and his authority for them to this end have i been born and to this end am i come into the world that i should bear witness unto the truth from the book of john chapter 18 verse 37 I came to cast fire upon the earth, and how I would that it were already kindled. From the book of Luke, chapter 17, verse 49. I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak these things. From the book of John, chapter 8, verse 28. My teaching is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will it to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it be of God, or whether I speak from myself. He that speaketh from himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh the glory of him that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteous is in him. From the book of John, chapter 7, verse 16 through 18. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Book of John, chapter 6, verse 35. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. If ye abide in my word, then are ye truly my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Book of John, chapter 8, verse 31 through 32. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Book of John, chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. He that heareth my word and believeth had passed out of death into life. Book of John, chapter 5, verse 24. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit 
and they are life. Book of John, chapter 6, verse 63. Every word, every parable, every teaching of the way shower had for its ultimate purpose the bringing of his message of God into the troubled lives of his hearers. He was the door through which they could enter. He was the light that would light their consciousness to this kingdom within. One day as he taught, there was a commotion and he stopped to listen. While a smile perhaps played over the faces of his audience, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. From the book of Luke chapter 11, verse 27 through 28. A friendly interchange, perhaps, but a genuine earnestness on the part of both. Practically everything centered around his great fundamental message, his gospel, his good news of the consciousness of God in the minds, the hearts, the souls of men, the finding of this kingdom within and the results that would follow. He was not so much a teacher of morality as he was a prophet, an adventurer in truth, who was bringing to the world a new truth, so to speak, a truth so fundamental that when actually received and acted upon, it would touch modify and direct every act and phase of life. It would bring a positive gain in security, while unbelief resulting in its rejection would bring loss or even desolation. So convinced is he of this fact that he boldly proclaims, Everyone that heareth these words of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And everyone that heareth these words of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and smote upon that house, and it fell and great was the fall thereof. From the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Work not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which abideth unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. The book of John, chapter 6, verse 27. And how simply and clearly he points out the gain in the better and more abiding things of life. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth consume and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where thy treasure is, there will thy heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is the darkness! No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 19-24 through 24. A certain steadfastness and moral fiber is required, he says. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. From the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 62. His injunction to any who would be his follower is put first things first. Quote, he said unto a certain man, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But he said unto him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But go thou and publish abroad the kingdom of God. End quote. Book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 59 through 60. Men must be not only receivers, but must be doers of the word. They must not only enter into this new consciousness, this new birth, but they must let it have an unceasing grip on their lives. They must not only believe, but they must do. They must not only receive the truth, but they must also live the life. If the truth take real hold of the life, it will push the life out into action, he affirms. Quote, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, 
But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? End quote. Book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34 through 37. He had great confidence not only in the redeeming power, but in the endurance of that truth that he brings. Quote, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. End quote. Book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 31. He felt that the truth he had realized and was bringing to the world had a timeless element. He felt that this truth was so fundamental and was so practical in its elevating and helpful power in the individual life and also in the collective life of the people that he was willing even to give his life for it. And as events proved, when the final clash came with the entrenched organization of privilege and enervating dogma, he did die for it. There can be no greater evidence of his mastering belief as to how helpful and valuable the truth he brought might be in the lives of men and women everywhere. It would not only be of help in the everyday problems and affairs of life, but it would redeem them from their misconceptions and sins and errors of life. To repent and then to believe and to follow his truth meant forgiveness and the beginning of a new life. Their sins were thereby forgiven, and they should be forgotten. Even the recollection of them with its benumbing, beclouding, and enervating influence was to seize and to give place to the joy that his living truth would bring. It was simply to turn and to follow the truth, which would become as a light to their heretofore stumbling feet. To turn also from the blind leaders of the blind, the ecclesiastical peddlers of a lifeless system of form and inconsequential observances, and to follow this truth, this light of life that he brought, would make their redemption complete. There was no scheme of salvation. Rather, he bitterly condemned those who would make a pretense of such, especially as the prerequisites of any institution. Quote, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for ye shut the kingdom of heaven against them, for ye enter not in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering in to enter. Book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 13. Ye blind guides, he said of those he had just described and warned against, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That, a man's life, even in his wanderings away from the Father's fold, is a matter between him and his Father, and that his return brings joy not only to himself and all whom his life touches, but primarily to the Father. He sets forth simply and beautifully in his parable as related by Luke. Quote, what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. End quote. Book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 4 through 7. No less significant and interesting, as he states it, is the truth in the parable that immediately follows. Quote, Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she had found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. End quote. Book of Luke, chapter 15, verse 8 through 10. A friend, a man of great interests, very observant and understanding, believes that the sole purpose of life is experience. It is one of his cardinal beliefs, quite as basic as his belief in reincarnation, which in turn has to do with experience. 
Its real personal value lies, of course, in what one chooses to make of each experience. The Master throws many a light for guidance here, in the way. End of chapter 8 Please do hit that like button, and I'll meet you at the next video for the next chapter.